Bonsoir à tous et à toutes. On va juste attendre quelques minutes pour que la, le lien avec YouTube fonctionne et que aussi les personnes qui ne sont pas dans cette chambre, donc qui ne sont pas sur Zoom, mais qui euh, participent et, et euh, écoutent euh, cette conférence de l'extérieur puissent pouvoir le faire sans problème. Donc, juste quelques minutes et nous allons commencer. Merci. New link is sent to the uh, mailing list and uh, is on Twitter. <laughs> and we're live. You be, would you be able to put it in the chat? Uh, yeah. They can't find it on, uh, on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, Jean-Robert, uh, it's up to you. Can I start? Yeah. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Uh, um, my name is Jean-Robert Ravio, and I'm the co-director uh, of uh, our research unit. Uh, Center for Multipl Multidisciplinary and Multilingual Research. And we have this uh, welcome aboard this research seminar on languages and territories in globalization. And uh, usually we talk about uh, very serious and uh, academic topics such as migrations, uh, nation or city branding, um, the role of community is in the process of uh, globalization, Archite architecture, urban studies, the sense of place in literature and so on. But today we are going to speak about um, an icon of, um, I, I wouldn't say popular culture, but almost popular culture, which is James Bond with um, um, Klaus Dodd uh, and uh, Liza Fano. Um, well, James Bond is an icon, and as we are talking about uh, territories, languages, globalization, is it a global icon? We often have the feeling that it is global icon, but in fact, reading um, Klaus and Liza's book this week, trying to prepare for the seminar, I realized that um, <clears throat> this icon was uh, not so global. And uh, I think this is one of the part of the uh, very interesting parts in this uh, James Bond icon. There are uh, James Bond uh, story and James Bond analysis. Um, well, James Bond is very Anglo-American. He is a political instrument uh, carrying along uh, gender stereotypes that is all very well described in, uh, in the book. And I have to mention that um, uh, as a Sovietologist and specialist of Russia, I had a great interest in reading the Russian part of the book and, uh, and mentioning that the Soviets have their own uh, James Bond. I may talk a little bit about it in the questions. Um, so this is all very much James Bond after all, not being a usual academic 
topic, uh, uh, usual academic subjects, subject, sorry, is much in accord uh, with a geopolitical approach of, uh, of uh, and the, um, of one of the um, interests, um, main interest in our seminar is also uh, not only reality, but also imaginaries and fictions. And it's a great exploration of a fantastic geopolitical imaginary of our time. So I let you, um, I'm finished with my little introduction now. So I think this is my turn. Um, so I would like to start by thanking the University of Paris Nanterre for granting us the opportunity um, on the, uh, the library's opportunity to co-host the event with you, because the Pilipo, the Bibliothèque de Littérature Policière, has been weaving links with the world of universities for years now, and uh, we really am happy to honor them. So the Bibliothèque de Littérature Policière, which is also known as the Pilipo, is a public library in Paris that was founded by the city of Paris in 1984. And what, which was located within the public library of Mister Contrescarpe at the beginning, and the idea of creating a reference library that was dedicated to crime fiction and all things related blossomed in the early 70s, when a reading group, uh, when a reading group of librarians, of Lisbon, uh, Blondine, Catherine Cholet, promote um, a genre that was largely ignored by literary critics. And so um, they tried to promote this genre by reviewing parts of the production of crime fiction. And throughout the, the decade, librarians used English reference materials and they compared different editions of books in order to write a survey that was published in 1978 and entitled um, Enquête sur le roman policier. And so these years of extensive research that they did in order to write the survey led them to understand the need for a reference center where researchers could find both reference materials and uh, works by crime fiction writers. So in 1983, they signed a convention between the city of Paris and the National Library to transfer the 9,000 detective stories that were stored in the Arsenal to um, Mouffetard contre Oscar and the newly established Bibipo and to grant one copy of each crime fiction published in France to the Bibipo. As years went by and the collection grew in size, it became apparent that um, the, the, the collection needed a place of its own. And that's how the Bilipo as an institution of its own came to exist in 1995. And it is located now at 4850 Rue du Cardinal Lemoine in the Thief Arrondissement. So this library aims at collecting, preserving and promoting crime fiction above all, but not only. And it offers an interesting reference collection of critical essays and works on subjects such as authors, characters, or the, liter the different literary genres that compose crime fiction. Moreover, criminology, forensics, and news items are also represented in the collection. So this diversity of media mirrors the diversity of subjects that are broached in the library. If books are the core of the collection, we also have periodicals, sheet music, comic strips, objects, postcards, or posters. And librarians have created over 10,000 files um, of newspaper and magazine clippings on specific themes, but also authors and uh, producers. All of that uh, patrons can admire on site as it is not possible to check out any material. Furthermore, throughout its history, the library has received donations that noticeably enriched its collections. For instance, Raf Messac entrusted the Bilipo with his father's library and um, Regis Messac's thesis on crime fiction, which was the first ever to be published in France and entitled the detective novel Et l'influence de la pensée scientifique, which was published in 1929. So in order to promote such diverse and uh, original materials, La, the library keeps a busy cultural calendar and throughout the year it hosts talks, conferences and exhibits on a vast range of subjects. This year, for example, the Bilipo had the immense privilege of showing L'Europe du Polar, which you can see behind me a bit, um, which is a beautiful exhibition that was founded by European Credits. And this exhibit is uh, the product of a two-year reflection led by the University 
such as Mathieu Le Tourneur, Adrien Freinet, and Alice Jacquelin, as well as former head librarian Catherine Chauchard and the entire library team. It addresses the circulation of crime fiction in Europe from Les Mystères de Paris by Eugène Sue uh, to Netflix's European productions. And it studies how the circulation of crime fiction created a European imaginary around crime. L'Europe du Polar is one of the many productions that were engendered by a European program entitled Detect, um, detecting transcultural identity in European popular crime narratives. So unfortunately, with the coronavirus pandemic, the exhibition has been closed down by the first lockdown uh, after eight days after its opening and is yet closed down again, along with the cycle of conferences that we had thought of as complementary. However, however, sorry, we are um, still considering virtual solutions in order to make up for those events that were cancelled. And uh, the website that is dedicated to the exhibition is being updated with new contents. And you can access it at Europe du Polar in one word, .paris .fr. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camille. Uh, I must say it's a real pleasure uh, to work uh, at the Billy Poor. It was a real pleasure uh, before our exhibition um, uh, died twice uh, in the same year. Um, now I think it is time to introduce our guests, uh, Lisa Fennell and Klaus Dodds, whom I thank warmly uh, for accepting our invitation. Um, Lisa Fennell is Associate Professor in Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Oklahoma. Her research explores gender and its intersection with race, ethnicity and nationality in popular films, media and culture. She is the author of Warrior Women, Gender, Race and the Transnational Chinese Action Star, her first monograph, which won the Emily Tott Award for Best Work in Women's Studies from the PCA ACA. She is currently editing an anthology resisting James Bond's social injustice in the Daniel Craig era with Christoph Lindner, and it uh, is the host of License to Critique, a podcast exploring gender in the world of James Bond and beyond. Klaus Dodds um, is Professor of Geopolitics and Director of Research for the School of Life Sciences and Environment at Royal Holloway University of London. He researches in the areas of uh, geopolitics and security, media, popular culture, ice studies, and the international governance of the Antarctic and the Arctic. He has published a number of books, including International Politics and Film. His latest popular geopolitics article was entitled The Geopolitics of Nordic Noir, Representations of Current Threats and Threats and Vigilantes in Contemporary Danish and Norwegian Serial Drama. Uh, needless to say that I will uh, read these recently published or soon to be published work with great uh, pleasure. They are our guests uh, today to speak about the book they've written together entitled Geographies, Gender and Geopolitics of James Bond, published in uh, 2017. And um, it occurred to me when reading this book, when preparing the exhibition Camille talked about earlier, uh, that this work would be of interest for our research center because of its interdisciplinary nature by joining the forces of geography, gender studies, film studies and uh, popular geopolitics. Um, and specifically uh, for our seminar focused on languages, space and globalization because the book, I quote, examines the ways in which physical and human environment are conceptualized, gendered and intersected by age, race, class and sexuality and then depicted in a mainstream culture, which in turn influences social, spatial discourses and practices. And um, it also seemed to me interesting to start a dialogue between James Bond scholars and Russian and Eastern of Europe scholars from our research center, since the spies, the Eastern and Western cultures respectively produced are not very much alike and presumably defined by contrast. For instance, one can read at the end of chapter four of Klaus and Liz's book that there are only three scenes of Bond in his home, Dr. No, Leven Ladar and Skyfall. Whereas when the Bulgarian author Andrei Gulyashki in his 1966 books entitled 
a vacuum Zahoff against 0, 7, introduces the spy a vacuum Zahoff. He chooses to depict him waking up at home in his pajamas, mm -hmm. then showering, mm -hmm. and spending mm -hmm. an mm -hmm. uneventful mm -hmm. day thinking mm -hmm. about the girl mm -hmm. a long time ago, working all day long, feeling pleasurably weary at the end of the day. So after listening to the presentation of Klaus and Lisa, I think we will have much to say and to discuss about James Bond, the way he's created by geographies and geopolitics, the way the fiction produces geographies, but also, as Lisa's podcast suggests, also beyond the Iron Curtain by comparing him to his opposite numbers. The floor is yours. Well, hi, I'm Dr. Lisa Funnel. Thank you so much for the invitation and for the warm welcome. Um, Klaus and I are going to share our time today. I'll talk about the intersectional and interdisciplinary readings of James Bond, and then Klaus will take over from there to talk about some of the interesting work that we are doing. So James Bond is the longest running film franchise in history. It is estimated that over half of the world's population have seen a Bond film. Now, there are approximately 7.6 billion people living on Earth, so that means that 3.8 billion people have seen a Bond film, and this is almost an unfathomable global reach. In addition, millions more are familiar with the Bond brand, its archetypes, storylines, themes, visual style, and music, through its referencing and other facets of popular culture worldwide. There are even James Bond tours, museum exhibitions, and lifestyle guides out there. So James Bond as a figure and as a franchise permeates global popular culture. The Bond films have inspired an unprecedented degree of transgenerational fandom. That means that generation after generation after generation and probably another generation in there have come to know and love James Bond. This fandom not only spans six decades, but it also extends across the world. James Bond has served as an enduring global icon for nearly half of cinematic history. And during this time, the world has changed. We have seen social, political, economic, and ideological changes. We have seen the redrawing of national boundaries and shifting of geopolitical alliances. We have seen the rise of such social movements as civil rights, feminism, Occupy Wall Street, Me Too, and Black Lives Matter. And we've seen the struggle for natural resources and the impacts of climate change. The James Bond films register and reflect these seismic shifts. They present the impression that while the world has changed, we still need the figure of Bond and his old school ways to safeguard the physical safety and geopolitical security of the UK and its closest allies. Bond remains a steadfast figure of continuing British influence in the world, even as the power of the British Empire wanes. As a result, we believe it's imperative to study the messages being relayed through the Bond films about power, identity, and geopolitics how they are depicted, enacted, and embodied as Bond embarks on state-sanctioned missions. So this leads to an important question. How do we read James Bond films? Well, James Bond studies is a relatively young field of study. My goal here is to give a very brief overview to help position our research rather than provide a detailed genealogy. And if you are interested in some suggested readings, please send me an email. I'm happy to share them. The first concentrated period of Bond scholarship was in the early 2000s. A handful of important works were published on the cultural history of James Bond. And most often scholars took an English or film studies approach in their work. During this time, Klaus began publishing research on the popular geopolitics of James Bond with, with such titles as Screening Geopolitics and License to Stereotype. He explored how post-war and Cold War geopolitics were being depicted through the places, spaces, and material contexts of the Bond film. And this research was my first point of contact with Klaus. The second wave of Bond scholarship came after the release of Casino Royale in 2006. 
This sparked new academic interest in the franchise. Scholars utilized a wider range of approaches stemming from various fields, such as history, communications, cultural studies, gender studies, and philosophy. This period also saw the emergence of a subfield of gender studies within James Bond scholarship. In my research on feminism and femininity in James Bond is part of this era. I explore the intersection of gender with race, ethnicity, sexuality, nationality, and ability as well as the narrative and visual differentiation of women across the series. And my research on Bond was Klaus's first point of contact with me. Our research partnership arguably represents an interdisciplinary turn in James Bond studies. This has resulted in some fascinating research projects, at least for us. And our publications not only fill conceptual gaps with topics that have yet to be addressed, but they also carve out new intersectional pathways of engagement. Our research centers on fleshing out what we have termed heartland geopolitics. We are interested in exploring how Britain's national security in the Bond film is presented as being intimately connected to the title character. So in other words, how Bond and Britain co-constitute one another. Our research on heartland geopolitics revolves around four key themes heroism and bodies, mobility and immobility, objects and technology, and the elemental. First, the body plays a central role in the emotive world of Bond. Bond is a gentleman spy who uses his body, touch, and charm to heroic effect. These elements shape our understanding of his activities and his standing in the narrative. They relay notions of privilege and social advantage in various environments. They connote authority, power, and claims to knowledge through the body of Bond. However, an intersectional reading of Bond focuses on more than just his body. It examines his strategic partnerships with other key players in the field. It considers the makeup of his institutional support within MI6, and it identifies patterns of domination, resistance, and solidarity. Bond might venture out into the field without a regular partner, but mission success often depends on his interactions with other people and especially women. The actions of and outcomes for these characters send us messages about who is charged with and trusted with keeping Britain safe and how protective labor is divided, particularly on gender and racial lines. With respect to gender and spy activities in the world of Bond, women are often associated with signals, intelligence, and office work, while men are tasked as field agents who operate in dangerous public and private spaces. With respect to race, as notable in the most recent Daniel Craig films, the demotion of the first black money penny in Skyfall, along with the promotion of Q to field operations inspector, returns the franchise to the traditional national security order that was temporary, temporarily thrown into flux when Judy Gench took over as M. As a result, the series returns to a problematic division of labor in which white men continue to operate within the inner sanctum with gender, racial, and ethnic minorities through the figures of Eve Money, Penny, and Felix Leiter, for example, offering their support from the narrative periphery. Second, mobility is crucial for Bond and the depiction of heartland geopolitics. We are interested in various forms of mobility, including geographical, through Bond's crossing of continents and borders, physical, through his navigation of spaces and obstacles, and social through his inhabiting of and movement between personal and professional milieus. Bond is a highly educated, white, heterosexual, able-bodied, cisgender man. He uses both physical and social attributes to his advantage. His familiarity with the casino, the opera, and high-end restaurants offers him opportunities. Bond has the ability to talk his way into such places and establish contact with his targets, rather than being turned away or accused of being out of place, based on his social locations alone. 
he uses his social privilege to strategic advantage. Thus, places and social situations in the world of Bond are coded, defined, and even conquered by Bond's capacity to move into and through them. And on the odd occasion when Bond is denied access or he's rendered immobile, the narrative focuses on how Bond will overcome these physical and social obstacles. But these barriers are ultimately presented as being temporary rather than permanent interesting plot points rather than manifestations of systematic oppression. Third, we consider the importance of objects and technology. Our examination goes beyond a valorization of gadgets, and instead we consider how these elements are invested with geopolitical significance. In recent years, the Bond films have increasingly focused in on surveillance from the GPS tracker injected into Bond's arm in Casino Royale, to the technology that enabled the quantum network to spy on MI6 and its allies, to the corrupt Western-led secret surveillance program Nine Eyes unveiled in Spectre. Bond not only uses surveillance technology, but also finds ways to circumvent it. In order to keep Britain safe, Bond and his trusted allies must exercise sound judgment about when to access and trust surveillance technologies, as well as the intelligence that they reveal. Finally, we argue for the importance of the elemental in defining heartland geopolitics. Bond's capacity to enroll, utilize, and resist elements defines his heroism. Rarely is there a Bond film that does not feature the figure floating through the air, swimming or diving underwater, and surviving mountains, deserts, underwater, and jungle-like environments. Our research not only explores the use of earth, air, fire, and water, but also how Bond's body withstands stress and strain through his interactions with these elements, while using his judgment to make the most of these dangerous situations. Beyond corporeality, we consider how Bond is metaphorically depicted as being in his element. This is not only a marker of professional competence, but it also registers his feel for the institutional pressures and structures that are being imposed on him. Now, in terms of our collaborative approach, we have developed a process that enables transnational and interdisciplinary research, one that opens up space for new and innovative lines of inquiry. Our research on James Bond is largely passion-based. Although we have individually published a substantial body of research on the series, our collaborative endeavors are prompted by our social, political, and cultural surroundings. It is not uncommon for us to exchange emails about a contemporaneous issue or event, followed by a consideration of how it might impact the world of Bond. For instance, how might Brexit impact Bond? How might it impact his mobility and ability to cross national borders? How might it impact his access to resources and intel? How might it impact his ability to make strategic alliances with agents or agencies? Regardless of the topic, we remain interested in how gender and geopolitics are depicted and how these representations might influence social consciousness. Now, our goal is to publish original research that explores popular culture in new and innovative ways. We aim to fill in the conceptual and theoretical gaps. These arise from an over-reliance on a particular disciplinary perspective and approach. We aspire, to read, we aspire to read James Bond through a different lens. So for instance, we are the first to explore the elemental geographies of James Bond from the ways that earth, air, fire, and water shape our reading of gender and geopolitics in the series, to the critical role of resource conflict over diamonds, water, solar power, and oil. The franchise sends out potent messages about Britain standing in the world as Bond uses, redirects, consumes, or controls various physical elements. Once we are inspired by a topic, we engage in the process of brainstorming via email. Given that we work in different fields, institutions, countries, continents, and even time zones, email is the most effective mode of communication for us. 
Now, our partnership is certainly one for the digital age. We did not actually speak or even meet in person until after we published a co-authored book, edited a special journal issue, and wrote nearly a dozen journal articles, book chapters, and popular pieces on James Bond. And in fact, this is only the second time that we have spoken to each other. We did all of our prep for this presentation via email. So while verbal communication is rare for us, it is a welcome and exciting change. In spite of this, or maybe even because of it, our brainstorming is both personal and personable. We often talk about our ideas, impressions, and interpretations from a first-person perspective, and we allow space for personal digressions. This has helped us to develop a sense of camaraderie, a sense of familiarity and trust with each other, as well as a, a safe space within which we can share and test our ideas. Even when we transpose our brainstorming into a formal document, with one of us initially organizing the line of argument, and you will know who that person is, that's usually the first author of, of any piece that we do, and then the other does editing uh, of the structure and the language, the personal dialogue for us continues in the margins. We use the track changes function to provide comments, questions, and a lot of digressions. Our mode of communication remains congenial and conversational, even as the structure and the language of the piece becomes more formal. One of the most enjoyable parts about collaborating together is having the opportunity to think, create, and innovate with a scholar in a different field. Our work is not only interdisciplinary, as it combines international relations, security studies, and popular geopolitics via Klaus, with gender studies, film studies, and cultural studies via me, but it also opens up space for new avenues of thought. Although we are each considered to be experts in our respective fields, we do not simply stay in our own disciplinary lanes, but rather, rather we challenge ourselves to color outside of the lines to think across, if not beyond our formal training with the knowledge and comfort that our collaborator is there to help us shape, develop, and in many ways, vet our ideas. As a result, we're able to analyze popular culture through an expanding, expansive, and truly interdisciplinary lens. As a result, our scholarship is not simply the sum product of our ideas or insights from different or respective uh, disciplines. It's not a composite, but rather an amalgamation. Our work is synergistic in nature as our concepts and theories are amplified, enhanced and expanded by our collaborative effort. Rather than dividing research along disciplinary lines with each of us being responsible for a different section, we remain actively involved in every facet of knowledge production from brainstorming and writing to editing. Even during the copy editing phase, we complete our reviews in tandem, and then we discuss potential changes in order to ensure that the other person is in full agreement. This approach requires flexibility from each of us in order to maximize our time engagement. Given the difference in time zones, as well as the necessity of sleep, I will wake up early and Klaus will work late into the evening. And we often work through our projects in concentrated bursts of intellectual engagement. While this might not be the most efficient mode of collaboration, it has been highly effective in producing a steady flow of scholarship, as well as hopefully intriguing and original re readings of the James Bond franchise. Our collaborations are intellectually invigorating and personally fulfilling as we challenge ourselves and each other to think more deeply, constructively, and expansively about popular culture. So on that note, I will turn things over to Klaus. Thanks, Lisa, um, very much. And I will, if all goes well, I will try and share my screen with everybody and show you a few images just to sort of pick up a, um, Oh, hang on a minute, I, I may not be able to. It says host disabled by screen sharing. I don't know, Adrian, if you can, can you give me permission or, 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 or am I asking too much? I think it's okay now. Oh, is it? Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Well, you're very kind. So let's see if this will work when I get my 
little presentation up. So I wanted to show you. Is that working? Yep. Is that okay? Yes, that's okay. You can see it. Brilliant. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so really just to sort of um, pick up on um, some of the, the comments that Lisa's um, kindly sort of offered to sort of set us, set us up, I just wanted to just pick, pick on a few more things that hopefully give you a sense of how the book came about and some of the things that sort of underpinned it in terms of ideas. And one of the things that um, certainly uh, shaped uh, my interest in James Bond, enduring interest, uh, is partly read through my, my own sort of um, commitment to popular geopolitics as a uh, subdivision, if you like, or subdiscipline. Um, of critical geopolitics and kind of anglophone political geography uh, more generally. And of course, one of the things that you discover very quickly in any field is that um, it attracts and enriches and gets enriched by, sorry, um, scholars outside geography. So one of the really intriguing aspects of popular geopolitics at the moment is, um, is actually a new generation of scholars have come from cultural studies, feminist studies, um, history and goodness knows where else, and actually really contributed and uh, made this field, I think, a very, very vibrant one. And there have been lots of different strands to that research. And some of the earliest work, I think, played with the idea of the sort of the co-mingling of the real and the real. Um, some of the work that I think is both populated popular geopolitics and international relations engagement popular culture has looked to the importance of things like narrative, framing, genre, imaginaries. And we've seen lots of um, really intriguing uh, work that's uh, purported to analyze world politics through, for example, the, the figure of the zombie as I put there, or to think about um, world politics as a series of almost uh, generic interventions, you know, sort of world politics as action thriller, world politics as tragedy or horror or whatever, whatever it, it might be. But I also, I think there's another important strand to a lot of popular culture uh, and popular geopolitics, which is about the, the weaponization of popular culture, uh, the role of rumors, conspiracies, misinformation, black ops, hacking, spoofing, um, Actually, it reminded me, there's a, there's a lovely story, um, I think from the 1970s, when uh, I think the CIA started to learn a little bit more about um, Soviet fictional spies. And I remember reading a, a, a delightful piece, which they thought they had this sort of really important piece of classified information, but it turned out to be an extract from a piece of Soviet fiction uh, that somebody had misunderstood or misclassified as, as uh, anything but fiction. And I'm sure when we get into the conversation, there's probably lots of subtle and uh, not so subtle intersections between the popular, the literary, the cultural, the real, and, and the, the raw intelligence that spy agencies thrive on. Um, James Bond is really a sort of geopolitical gift that just um, keeps on giving. Uh, it's difficult to underestimate uh, why uh, uh, Ian Fleming has been quite so captivating. Um, important to say, of course, if the British have had a love affair with James Bond and Ian Fleming, we shouldn't forget the French either. Uh, it's really important to bear in mind that Ian, uh, Ian Fleming was, was really a Francophone. James Bond, of course, has lots of important and interesting things happen to him in Paris and uh, in the novels as well. France is, is never really very far away. And that also, if we go next door and include Switzerland, uh, we also readily appreciate both in novels and films that um, James Bond really is a very, very transnational figure and has attracted, of course, substantial scholarship, not just in the Anglophone world, but in the Francophone world and also the German speaking world, just that, and that's just within the European context. Um, and many James Bond scholars 
uh, are very, very attentive to the intersection between the novel and the film and actually many other multimedia outputs from James Bond. So when we talk about James Bond, it really is, I think, as we understand well, an assemblage of literary, cultural, filmic products. And of course, Ian Fleming was writing at a very particular time, as Lisa's already hinted at, when Britain, uh, as Dean Acheson famously said, was losing an empire and struggling to find a role in the world. Um, I would suggest to you that remains uh, true today as it was in the late 50s and early 1960s. Um, another element I think we also want to draw attention to, partly because Lisa and I have been writing about this recently actually, is the extraordinary importance of the James Bond filming process. So actually thinking about what did it take to make James Bond possible, particularly when he hits the screen uh, from 1962 onwards. Well, one of the characters that looms very, very large in all of this is the uh, well-known set designer, Sir Ken Adam. Um, I interviewed Ken Adam actually many, many years ago, uh, went to his very grand house in central London and discovered, uh, which uh, really amused him, that actually his real first name was Klaus. Um, so, of course, he, he enjoyed it enormously uh, that we were both Klauses and we were talking about our shared Austrian Germanic heritage. Um, so I think he warmed me in a way that I didn't quite expect, but he was, a, he was an absolutely charming, wonderful man. Uh, very difficult to interview, I have to tell you, because his wife kept coming into the room and interrupting us and trying to offer us lots of coffee and biscuits. And, and Sir Ken had this wonderful white Rolls Royce that he was very, very concerned about where it was parked in the street. And he lives next door to Harrods, if you know, that sort of uh, rather overpriced department store in central London. And, and so every time he says, I'm so sorry, so sorry, I've got to move the white rolls. I don't want to get it scratched. Anyway, that's a story for another time. Who says research is easy? Um, there's another element to all this. So Sir Ken Adam was producing these wonderful set designs that really added a huge amount to the atmospherics of James Bond. The other important thing to say that Lisa and I were always intrigued by is what I've called here rather grandly the political economy of James Bond. You know, James Bond was really expensive to produce and make. And when those Bond films came out, it was a huge gamble in terms of actually would indeed 50% of the world's population end up watching a James Bond film. That wasn't clear. And so one of the things that our work tried to do as well is to be sensitive to some of those political, economic, financial, aesthetic forces and drivers that really, really shaped James Bond. And also not to assume that when, for example, James Bond becomes popular, say, in Japan, that that transition was straightforward. You'll notice here, and that's why I put it, um, the poster, is that in East Asia, for example, James Bond is always known as 007, never as James Bond. Uh, whereas, of course, in Britain and the United States, we're far more likely to talk about James Bond rather than 007. And James Bond's also been controversial. So, for example, uh, there have been moments when depictions, for example, of Korean characters, um, Afro-Caribbean characters, uh, depictions of Japan or whatever it might be, has also caused local and regional strife and made James Bond controversial. But of course, James Bond also works fundamentally, as do so much of um, intelligence drama, certainly in the West, because of this Cold War geopolitical context. Uh, nowhere more so, of course, during this period, is there an interest in, as I put here, division space. This idea that, you know, that what makes James Bond's mobility so intriguing is the way in which he moves in and out of spaces that are either already divided, uh, such as Berlin, or spaces that are on some kind of geopolitical fault line, whether it's the Caribbean in a post-Castro era, or whether it's parts of Asia that uh, are in a sense in the grip of proxy struggles involving the United States, China, the Soviet Union. So this is a, a recurring motif of Bond uh, from Russia with Love would be an excellent example of Istanbul functioning as this kind of 
uh, fractured city lying between East and West and these rival spying agencies. James Bond's uh, mobility, of course, is more often than not a very privileged one. It's exactly as Lisa says, one that is absolutely enabled and empowered by a whole set of privileges and affordances um, that others would struggle to match. Uh, you know, already, for example, Bond was flying uh, on Concord where many British people were simply uh, experiencing for the first time the idea that you might be able to have a so-called package holiday and fly to Spain. Well, Bond by that stage was already a global traveler. And uh, I think one of the appeals of Bond for many audiences has exactly been this kind of unfettered mobility that very few of us um, actually get to enjoy. Interestingly, Bond has shifted somewhat. In the 60s and 70s, you more often uh, would see Bond flying regular commercial airlines like Air France, Pan Am, Transworld Airlines. Some of these, of course, have disappeared and gone bust. Uh, now it's more, far more common to see Bond flying smaller planes uh, and not commercial airlines. And we might speculate on why that is. Um, Lisa and I have also, as part of this interest in the elemental, been uh, quite intrigued about the role that very particular spaces play in making the geopolitics of James Bond, uh, challenging, enjoyable, formidable, uh, and the underground, of course, looms large. One of the things we learned from the Cold War was that it really does matter that you have bunkers and secret places that others can't spy on you. And of course, uh, James Bond repeatedly suggests that the evil genius uh, will stop at nothing uh, to ensure that as far as possible, his activities are as secret and nefarious as possible. So the underground has been an incredibly important element, uh, not only for, if you like, materializing Cold War geopolitics, but also giving something for Bond to struggle with or to struggle against. Threats and dangers, of course, have come and go, but one of the um, consistent elements of the James Bond series has to be has always been to try and complicate binary divisions. You know, Doctor No is dismissive of East and West and these points on the compass. Well, for forty years later in the series, there is still this kind of dismissiveness of great power rivalries that the the hench people don't really have to bother with such things. You know, their their remit is in a sense to work beyond the state and actually to see the state as uh, a mere container from which they can base their operations and put into practice their criminal or terror-based networks, whether they move money, people, objects. Uh, geography uh, is rarely a barrier in that sense. So just as Bond enjoys often unfettered mobility, so many of the people, of course, he confronts. And that means therefore that there are all kinds of absolutely, as I put here, topographies and typologies. There are places that Bond wants to get into. There are places that are secret or part of some elaborate cover story. There are networks to be broken into. Uh, there are of course public places where some of this comes into sharp relief. Lisa's quite rightly, it seems to me, talked about casinos, hotels would be another important element, but always, there, there is a competition, if you will, to find your way through the nooks and cracks and crannies of global geopolitics, where rival knowledges come into sharp relief. Finally, just to finish off with, um, partly because, of course, the interests of this centre and the, and, the, and the participants is, is partly about um, how popular culture gets worked, worked with, engaged with, reacted to. And I just wanted to draw attention to three or four quick things to finish off with. Number one, my favorite story uh, involving uh, a former KGB colonel who famously came over to us uh, in the 1980s, Oleg Gordievsky. One of the lovely things Gordievsky said, and I think he was just teasing us uh, because we were so grateful to have one of what a Russian spy come to us as opposed to lots of the British spies go to the Soviet Union, of course, in the 1950s. He said, you know, we were we were 
we were absolutely captivated by James Bond behind the Iron Curtain. Very few of us were allowed to see James Bond. You know, they were part of the closed shows. And he said, we just thought James Bond was incredible. So we had this really sort of really unrealistic vision of MI6. We just thought, oh my God, if they're all like James Bond, we're doomed. Um, and he said, we were quite disappointed to learn that not everybody in MI6 is like James Bond. And I remember hearing that comment and I think, no, I thought everybody in MI6 was like James Bond. It was a bit crushing, to be honest. Second thing to say is um, partly because I'm very conscious of uh, the audience we're speaking to is there is some wonderful Francophone scholarship on James Bond studies. And I don't want to, and I'm sure Lisa wouldn't want to either, to give you the impression that there is an amazing work um, being done by other European or non-English speaking scholars. I've just given you one example. Um, I do read French uh, slowly, but I do read it and I've read some wonderful books. Here's one. There's another one which I love, which is about called Fleming's France, uh, which was published about three years ago, um, which is absolutely superb. Two other things. Um, we have both published in the International Journal of James Bond Studies. We did a really fun piece together. Um, just to make a pitch here on behalf of the editor and the team, this is a really great place to see an extraordinary range of James Bond scholarship. And it makes the point that Lisa started off with how interdisciplinary it is. Um, and there's lots of wonderful examples, um, if you're interested in terms of wider Anglophone scholarship. And then finally, just to make the point, um, that James Bond continues to find its way in the world. And as I'm sure many of you know, Skyfall did make it into China, which was a huge, huge hit um, and a success, actually. Talk about political economy of James Bond. Here's a good example. But there was a cost. You know, it was censored. And references, for example, to prostitution in Macau didn't make it uh, past the censor, censors. Um, but... I think what's really interesting, one of the things I'm interested in keeping an eye out is just to think about as China becomes more of a global cultural power, as much as economic and military power, I think we should watch very carefully. It's in continue globalization of the cultural industries. So just as Wolf Warrior, for example, presented a very, very particular Chinese reading of the action thriller, I'm really interested going forward what Chinese spy cinema is going to offer us and whether we're going to see the Bulgarian and Soviet uh, alternatives to James Bond that we saw during the Cold War. Increasingly, are we going to see the Chinese counterparts taking on James Bond in a very, very obvious way, in a way that films like Tomorrow Never Dies, of course, had James Bond working with a, a Chinese uh, counterpart. But that's very different. That was very much built around a well, well-known actor plus somebody who was helping bond as opposed to for example being a very active rival so i'll stop there thank you very very much thank you very much uh, klaus and lisa for um these perspective on uh, james bond uh, now it's time for uh, questions and uh, discussions uh, i've got some uh, of my own but i, I think maybe uh, um, uh, Jean Robert or Lucia, or uh, I'm sure uh, they will have some uh, questions. And you've raised your hand, Jean Robert. So, uh, yeah, <clears throat> I've raised my hand for the first time um, to test my ability to do so on Zoom. So I'm very proud. <laughs> but you might you might start if you want. It's up to you. No, no, no. Let's go. Okay, so I have the privilege of having read the book before the conference, not entirely, but I have read most of it. And so I have three questions that are very open questions in the, and, and some are rather remarks than questions actually. Um, as a specialist of the Russian world and Soviet world, I have uh, knowledge of a Soviet James Bond. I mean, there is a figure in the Soviet fiction called Stirlitz, uh, who might play uh, a little bit the role of a Soviet James Bond. Uh, he is out of a series, a TV series that has been shot in uh, 1973, 
Um, I, I think you know him, um, most of you, some of you. Uh, the series is called 17 Moments of Spring, and it has been shot in 17, 1973. And um, it portrays the exploits of a Soviet spy who is operating undercover in Germany. And, uh, and uh, we see him as a Soviet spy, but uh, undercover German, uh, infiltrating the, Rush, the, uh, the German um, uh, higher ranks of the army, of the German army. Uh, and he is a real star in, in Soviet fiction. And for this Rush, Soviet and Russian and both Soviet uh, people, he is uh, a sort of alternate alternative of James Bond. And what I'm, I'm not going to tell you more about him, but um, what is very um, um, different from Bond, uh, is first of all, he is, th th this movie is not at all an action movie. There is almost no, there are no gadgets, no actions with well, some gadgets, but very professional spy gadgets, not the uh, all fantastic ones of James Bond. And um, it seems that a lot of, of the narrative of this Stirlitz is based on, on his internal life. There is an, um, an off voice constantly, uh, running uh, the show, and uh, we, we we hear constantly hear what the thoughts of this Stirlitz are, and that never happens in James Bond. So is it that uh, does James Bond have no internal life, or is it that it's displayed otherwise? This is a very open question. My second question would be um, about M, and I really really liked the. Uh, I think it, by the end of the book there is. Uh, um, a reflection upon M and uh, the fact that it's a woman and it kind of inverts the uh, gender balance or I, I don't know how to say that. Um, and in, in some ways, uh, James Bond becomes the uh, uh, a kind of escort girl of M. Uh, there is something uh, I would like to test about. What, what could you tell us more about this character and uh, this character becoming feminized in the latest versions? This is my second open question and my last open question, uh, which is probably the most difficult, but it's very open. It's how do you see that, that the end of the Cold War, the, uh, the real end of the Cold War, I mean, historical end of the Cold War, the 1990s, how did this reflect in, in, in James Bond's character um, could you give us some details or something that you could point out and that I may, uh, for example, recycle and explain to my students and, and look smart to them? <laughs> That's all. Um, well, I can address probably the first two and, and, and see where Klaus wants to go run with them. I think that when it comes to the internal life of James Bond, cinematically, we don't necessarily get it, right? We're, we're focusing more on say actions, his interactions and the things that he says and without being pro provided with a voiceover narration or without Bond saying, this is what I think and feel and this is what I know, we really don't have a true sense of his internal life. And only till we get to the Daniel Craig era do we actually start to see a <clears throat> development of, um, his personal struggles, because it is an origin story. Uh, there's a new take that is happening in the Daniel Craig era. There's a shift in terms of the style, the tone, the narrative focus and so forth. But I would turn your attention to the, um, to the novel series, because in the novels, Ian Fleming does address, in a sense, the inner world of Bond. Bond has insecurities. Um, I was always shocked reading the novels that, you know, Bond wanted to have kids and eventually retire from the service. He didn't feel that marriage was for him, but he was very interested in having a family. And so I think that is an element where you can do different things in terms of the novels, uh, versus what you can do in the films. And I do find it interesting, the text that you cited, they managed to kind of blend the two of them together in ways that the Bond franchise has yet to do. Um, and so I would say folk, the, the novels offer more of the inner life and the inner development um, than, than the films do with the exception of the Craig era films. Um, in terms of Judy Dench coming on as as M, it happened at a particular moment. In the 1990s, we see the rise of post-feminism, uh, which is a movement that puts forward the idea that uh, gender inequality no longer exists, 
the post and post feminism means that feminism is over. Women have all the essential liberties that they were fighting for during the second wave. Um, and that women should not be held back in any way, shape or form, whether it's in the office, other levels of business, or even when it comes to bodily autonomy, you can express yourself sexually and not be judged for it. Those are sort of the elements of post-feminism. And post-feminism had a large impact on, on popular culture in general, but also in the depiction of spies um, in, in the world of, of, of pop culture, and especially in American popular culture, British popular culture. Um, I would say in the um, Pierce Brosnan 1990s era, um, she definitely challenges Bond. Um, she calls him a sexist and misogynistic dinosaur, a relic of the Cold War. Um, really trying to make this point. And I think the points really do um, present this idea or this impression that the world has changed and that women in that world have changed. It's not just geopolitical changes, it's gender politics have changed. And so M and these films are really populated with a range of women. You know, Bond is typically flanked with a good and a bad woman that he's interacting in between. And so we get this impression that Bond does not necessarily change. His responses to the women have to change, but we still need that old school, traditional uh, British masculinity to, to get us through. And we see M um, really challenging some of the sexism that happens within the workplace and within the intelligence uh, field, the intelligence industry, because she tends to be surrounded predominantly by men, men as generals, uh, men as spies. It's just her making her way through. And she does face a lot of critique and criticism. I think she's called by one character, the evil queen of numbers, um, as if her ambition and the ideas that she has are somehow at odds with the typical boys club that has really been at the heart of, um, in a sense, the, the inner sanctum, as I mentioned, of, of MI6. And then when we look at what happens in the Daniel Craig era, and I saw a comment uh, somebody made about the maternal um, element or the maternal turn, this is something that definitely happens in the Daniel Craig era. So we have Bond in a sense, um, I don't wanna say being birthed into a new role, but this idea of him growing and having growing pains, Judy Dench's M becomes more and more maternal as the time goes on. She, has a, she develops a very strong maternal connection to him. She, he seems to be sort of like the, you know, the little petulant child, but she has this, this soft spot for him. Um, and she offers him a lot of emotional support. So when Vesper Lynn dies, and if you look at the end of the novel, and I don't mean to swear, but the end of the novel ends with the bitch is dead. And that's the last line in, in the Casino Royale novel. But instead, you have M coming in in the filmic version saying, okay, well, you must know she did this to safeguard you and to protect you, offering Bond comfort, contextualizing, uh, contextualizing her actions for the audience, and really offering a more and more maternal presence. And this is really amplified in the film Skyfall, where she is presented as being the mother. Bond is the prodigal son who has returned. And of course, going to the home estate in Skyfall um, definitely emphasizes some of this, this imagery. But I think something that Klaus and I have talked about, and I know other scholars are, are talking about now, is the fact that when she dies, there is a return or flip back to the previous sort of style and structure uh, that happened in the pre-Dench era. And Klaus and I have talked about the fact that Spectre, the most recent film, is very reversionist. So while the first three Daniel Craig films are revisionist, they are, you know, playing with the genre, deconstructing aspects of the Bond film, and then reintroducing them with some twists, Spectre is deeply reversionist is, as it reverts us back um, to, to earlier politics. I've argued that uh, it reverts us back to um, the 1960s. I recently had a conversation on my podcast. It'll be coming out next week with Sam Goodman, who talks a lot about the end of empire. He relates that back to the 1950s and to Ian Fleming's work. But there certainly is this, this reversion back. And then the question is, how then does that affect um, the world of Bond? How does it affect um, his relationships with other supportive figures um, and, and so forth? And so I'll sort of leave it there and see if Klaus wants to piggyback on either of these and, and talking um, about the, the Cold War turn. Um, so thanks, thanks Lisa, and thanks Shoko Robert for the question. Um, it, it, I think it's, I mean, obviously, there are three elements to it. I mean, I think I think the uh, the Soviet uh, 
the Soviet James Bond and uh, the 70 Moments of Spring. I mean, it's, it's hugely interesting. I mean, one of the things I, I enjoyed in, uh, enormously was the idea that um, Putin was a fan and that, um, you, you know, that this actually was was part of his fandom, his enthusiasm uh, was part of the way in which he made the transition from KGB spy to city official and later mayor of St. Petersburg. Um, we don't, we, 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 you know, we, so you get these lovely sort of crossovers where, you know, just as we know that, for example, uh, Jack Kennedy loved, um, you know, the Ian Fleming novels. Uh, there's this, there's this delight in James Bond that actually every time we just want to write him off as a kind of ridiculous fictional spy, something comes along and you discover that, for example, Ian Fleming was being asked how to assassinate Fidel Castro. Um, so, the, the, so for me, this is incredibly interesting, these sort of wider cultural geopolitical context. The inner life is really important, I think, and a lot of the contrast, I think, between um, some of those Soviet depictions of spies, where I think spying was, was probably represented as a far more serious, even humdrum kind of job in a way that sort of speaks against the sort of the glamorizing, the, um, you know, the over spectacularized um, spying activities of James Bond. I think, by the way, in Her Majesty's Secret Service is probably the closest we get to a little bit of a glimpse of in, uh, sorry, James Bond's inner life uh, before we get to the Daniel Craig era. But of course, that's often, you know, been talked about as the, the, the least favourite James Bond by many, um, by many fans. Um, I think unfairly, but that's, that's neither here or there. I just want to say something quickly about the end of the Cold War. I mean, I think Goldeneye was really interesting for two reasons. Sorry, three. One, the franchise was in crisis. Um, it took a long time. I mean, lest we forget, you know, Timothy Dalton's era um, was not, I think, universally admired. Um, there was some unhappiness about the direction of films. It took six years for Goldeneye to appear. There was a huge amount of pressure on Piers Brosnan to be a star and to get the James Bond franchise back into its commercially successful ways. And I think there are two interesting things about the film that comes out. Number one, I think as Lisa's talked about, M is really fascinating in that film. And in particular, I always thought the most interesting part of the film was her office. How different was that office from the old M and the old Britain and the old Bond, lots of wood and pictures of, um, you know, naval battles and all the rest of it. So there's, you've got this juxtaposition between modern Britain wanting to be different, different office, different M, different, different view of the world. And then you've got this weird depiction of the Soviet Union, which is on the one hand, you know, this is this is this is the reality going forward in the 1990s. You thought you won the Cold War, but now we've got a crisis on our hand because the Soviet Union's fracturing, and actually, God knows what's going to happen to all the nuclear weapons and the military hardware. But you've also got through characters like Sukovsky a view that actually the Russian state has been criminalized. That so you've got this sort of double jeopardy. We just don't know what is going to happen. They've got too much money, too much weapons, and not enough authority and control. Um, and there's that lovely moment where Onya Top says, you know, Russia, a land of opportunity or something like that. Well, yeah, it's an opportunity to make money, but it's an opportunity for mayhem and mischief. And I think what Goldeneye does is just actually give the sense in which Russia is a failed state. And, and actually, it's kind of creatively, it's going to continue to provide lots of material for James Bond, as of course, sub the subsequent um, Pierce Brosnan era films do as well, to work geopolitical tension and, and dynamics into the scripts.
Thank you, uh, Klaus um, and Lisa. Uh, there's actually some uh, questions uh, coming from YouTube and uh, a bit of a discussion here uh, that actually enhance the topicality of your work and of your book. Uh, so I'm reading um, them to you. Uh, Flavi, uh, which I think is actually one of my students, so it's nice to be there tonight. Um, do you have some reflection about the fact that the future James Bond is a woman and Maxence answers um, he said the future 007 is a woman but James Bond still is uh, a man uh, and so it goes on like that um, Flavie says I think it's a good thing even if they are women in the previous James Bond films women still seem to need a man to help them and I'm fed up with this trend in numerous films um, etc etc problem eliminator uh, says uh, that still works the other way at times. Dr. Goodhead rarely if ever needs saving and her expertise is important to save the day, for example. And uh, so I, I might add to this uh, question about the new uh, James Bond, which is called uh, No Time to Die, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, well, um, how uh, would we be able to, 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 to name the franchise? Would it be the James Bond films or the Nomi series, the Nomi spy stories? Um, and if, um, as you said, Klaus, um, uh, James Bond is known as 007 uh, in uh, some parts of the world, um, what is the consequence of uh, this uh, change? Um, in, the, uh, in France, we say matricule, uh, but I don't know how to say it in, uh, in English. Do you want me to go out, start on that one, Klaus? Um, Sorry, I, I, was, I was just going to say one thing. Matricule in English is registration number. Thank you. So if you want the translation. Thank you. I think it's a really interesting development in James Bond. Um, and I think it is also a product of having an era where we're following this origin story and where we're making everything incredibly personal for James Bond. Every step that he takes, every element that we see. I always call the Daniel Craig era as being a big downer because like everything is so personal and he's always so emotional about everything. But I think that in some ways they painted themselves into a corner. Like, where do we go from here, right? He's developed as a spy. He's got the double O, you know, he's lost, you know, one lover. He's lost, you know, a surrogate mother. He's found out that Blofeld, which is absolutely ridiculous, is kind of like his stepbrother. Like everything is so intimate and he drives off with Madeline Swan. Where do we go from here? Um, and I feel as though this idea, and again, it's this is not trying to throw it out as a spoiler, this is out there, as you mentioned, you know, the premise of the film is James Bond retired. We see the redistribution um, of the double O number, which is something my students always ask me. They're like, how many double O's are there? What happens if somebody dies? Because we've seen double O's die. Like at the beginning, the training sequence, was it in uh, The Living Daylights, you know, where we see a bunch of double O's getting knocked off. Um, and, and we've seen in previous films, you know, there's sort of like chairs in a little bit of a U, so there might be 10 of them, or if we count the number of chairs, there's usually like a handful of them, maybe less than, than, than 12. Maybe that's developed over time, we don't know, but this is an interesting development. What happens when an actor retires and where do we go from here? Um, the question is, is some of the response to this, because there's been a lot of negativity to the point that Lashana Lynch has had to turn off her social media accounts. Is it the fact that he's, Daniel Craig is still James Bond, Lashana Lynch will take over the code name. Is the issue that people have the fact that it's a different actor getting the code name or is the issue the fact that it is a black woman who is getting the code name? There's very little intersectional diversity in James Bond. And when we even think about the arguments that have come out, these conversations, you know, could James Bond be played by somebody else? It's either a woman or a black man. That's the way that diversity is oftentimes discussed. And there really is no consideration of women of color or any other type of intersection in more than one way that differs from the status quo. And that's the way that James Bond has been represented. And so part of my question is, some, is this reaction to Lashana Lynch based on her identity categories in and of itself. And is the franchise in a sense testing the waters, right? You know, there, you know, who could be the next James Bond? Maybe this is just sort of throwing out a line saying, well, this is who we could possibly have in the role. 
My concern is what happens at the end? I don't know, I haven't seen it, I haven't read spoilers, but if the franchise is gonna return James Bond with that number, will Lashana Lynch have to give it up? Will she be demoted like Money Penny? Will she have to be killed off? in the film, which tends to be uh, the fate of so many uh, characters of racial and ethnic minorities when compared to James Bond's white, white identity. Will she be presented um, a lot like Mayday uh, from A View to a Kill? I've already noticed that people have been making those connections. So some of the official promotion from uh, ab about this film showing, uh, I think one of the trailers with Lashana Lynch was, has James Bond met its match? That came directly from the 007 Twitter account. That's the way that Grace Jones as Mayday was presented in A View to a Kill. And so is there gonna be a comparison there? Um, the, you know, A View to a Kill is an interesting film. I think that Mayday is a, is a fascinating character. A lot of Grace Jones, Grace Jones's personality is in there, but there's also the use of racial and racist stereotyping that is utilized in that representation. So how do we understand a comparison between these two women? Is there going to be a connection in that way? So I think that there's a lot that, that will be coming out from No Time to Die when it comes to this particular element. And I guess that is my question is, why is there such a reaction? And why, when we talk about who will play the next James Bond, um, do we still rely on the same identity categories time and time again? So I, I'm not sure if there was more to that conversation, uh, but I'll sort of leave uh, open the floor to Klaus to sort of pick up on this, if, if you'd like. Well, I was only going to say one thing, Lisa, uh, and I don't, you know, and since you've, you've answered the question, I think really, really very nicely. So I just make one counterpoint, which is just a reminder, is do you remember when, um, you know, Daniel Craig was being was being trialed for James Bond? And then we had British national newspapers say he's too blonde. He's, he's not big enough. Um, and he's, you know, he's completely... Uh, I think they, they, you know, we have this word in English, you know, floppish, is that actually there's, you know, he's just got, he's not got the James Bond persona about him. So one of the interesting things I think about um, Casino Royale was that uh, Daniel Craig went off to the gym uh, and worked incredibly hard to literally bulk himself up. Also, the hair was cut very short, precisely because he'd been mocked. Uh, and described as unacceptable. So I agree with you. I think the, the, the role of race and gender is incredibly important, but so is masculinity. And, and these different kind of models of masculinity that James Bond on and off the screen has often, I think, battled with. It's, you know, and maybe I'm thinking about this because obviously, you know, Sean Connery has recently left us. And it's interesting actually to see how his body and his persona and his presence has, has often been used as the yardstick to define who should be 007 and, I mean, and importantly, who shouldn't. Thank you. Is there uh, any question uh, in the Zoom yes. session? Yes, I have a question. Hi, Adrian. Hi. Hello. <laughs> yes, my name is John, John Solomon. I'm speaking from Lyon. I'm not in Paris. Uh, <clears throat> Nice to see both of you and everybody else. Um, uh, my question is, the problem I have is that I always want to take the conversation away from Bond towards the world. Um, and so I'll try to do that and to bring that back to Bond because um, that's kind of the thread that's tying us all together here. Um, I'm sure you all know, but I just want to repeat it so that we're, it's part of our discussion now that uh, the UK just passed the largest military budget since the end of the Cold War. And at the same time now, one of the leading government right-wing think tanks, the Policy Exchange Institute, right? Just released a um, report called A Very British Tilt, describing a military strategy uh, going back to really patrolling uh, the heart, the rim of the heartland. <clears throat> it's an anti, it's a very clearly anti-China strategy in which Hong Kong plays a, an extremely important role <clears throat> as a number of other places 
as well, particularly India, uh, functioning exactly the way Israel functions for the U.S. and U.S. settler colonialism and the settler colonial imaginary and the anchoring of a, this geostrategic containment of the heartland via a sort of <clears throat> geost uh, ge geostrategical pinning. This was first noted, I think, by Gayatri Spivak between Japan on the one hand and Israel on the other, that's the US strategy. And then Japan and India is part of this uh, UK strategy. It's filled with imperial nostalgia, the document itself. Uh, and of course, having it be prefaced by Abe Shinzo, the former prime minister of Japan, who himself, he's the maternal grandson of a class A War criminal. <laughs> okay, I'll stop there because I wanna try and just bring this all back to Bond where it seems to me, of course, there's going to be, I mean, I, I sort of vaguely followed the choice of who's gonna play Bond and all that and after Daniel Craig and it's, of course, this differential inclusion is, that's how neoliberalism works, right? Differential inclusion. Um, so it, it's kind of predictable. And then when you see this whole new Cold War coming up, it looks like it's a great opportunity for the Bond franchise <laughs> and probably a great opportunity for Bond studies <laughs> as well in the sense, and I'm just kind of curious how you see, how from your perspective, how you see that taking shape. Thanks a lot. Shall I, shall I have a go first, Lisa? Yeah, so um, thank you so much. I, one of the things I wanted to say to you actually was when you, you said, I think you, you, are, you, are you coming to us from Lille? Was that right? Because um, when, you, when you said that, it, it just reminded me that um, Ian Fleming's brother, Michael Fleming, who died in the Second World War, is buried at Lille. Um, so there's a connection there for you in terms of James Bond. Um, so I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think there are two elements for me to all of this, which is number one, I think, is cultural political economy of James Bond. You know, how does how does James Bond continue to reproduce itself? And so a lot of people, of course, have talked about the James Bond formula in various ways in terms of the narrative structure, the importance of the lead actor and all that kind of stuff. But also, I think the James Bond franchise has also uh, been very, very attuned to a whole series of social, cultural, and other kinds of aesthetic ruptures. So for example, you know, the impact of the Bourne uh, franchise on Bond was marked in terms of the focus on the active body and actually making sure that James uh, Bond was going to be played by somebody who had a kind of kinetic energy that perhaps someone like Roger Moore could never bring. So some of these debates about the race, the gender, the ethnicity, the body type of Bond and Bond's helpers are absolutely, I think, caught up in the sheer costs and markability of Bond. But there's also the other element, which I think you, which I think you, you actually importantly remind us, is that there's another strand to Bond scholarship that actually um, starts in the 1960s and 1970s, which is absolutely informed by political economy, by cultural Marxism that has seen James Bond in a very different kind of light. You know, this is the sort of thing where the British academic Anthony Barnett wrote a wonderful book called Iron Britannia many years ago. And one of the things that he makes, he makes the point, is the importance of cultural imaginaries and mythologies about Britain's role in the world. And so when you absolutely look at the recent reporting about the big investment in the Ministry of Defense operating budget and the rhetoric that goes with it, there's no question that we are no longer retreating east of Suez. You know, we are reimagining Britain 
as that country that did not retreat in the 1950s. Suez never happened. We never had the crisis. Um, and so one of the ways that Bond has been persistently read, understandably, in my opinion, uh, coming to it as a British citizen, is that James Bond has been the ultimate fantasy for absolutely trying to put to one side the discombobulation of the end of empire. And that actually part of what we see with Boris Johnson uh, trying to embrace this idea of global Britain is absolutely a, a kind of a project that I think M, uh, particularly the first M, would, would approve of, is that the, the global was absolutely the stage uh, for, for Britain's intelligence and military capabilities uh, to operate. And it's worth also, I think, uh, uh, just saying, finally, Inspector, there is a little reference to Nine Eyes, uh, and it talks about Nine Eyes involving, of course, Japan and South Africa, amongst other things. But one of the ways in which we underpin much of our claims to great power status is, first of all, we're a nuclear weapon state. And secondly, most importantly, we're part of the Five Eyes Network, the Global Intelligence Sharing Network. And I think in absolutely, James Bond is very much a figure that uh, can be understood in that context that others were first alerting us to 40 odd years ago. I don't think I have too much to add. I'd have to say, unfortunately, I'm not as up to date with um, some of the turns that are happening in, in the UK right now, given that I'm living in the US and we just went through a pretty contentious um, election that is, that's the only thing that I hear about these days. Um, but through this conversation, you know, it makes me think about, and just to sort of pull away and pivot forward, how will, due to the sort of the Anglo-American relationship and the connections, and we talk about this a lot in our, our book, you know, we really haven't seen too much of American politics making its way into the Bond films in the last, say, four years. How will um, the Trump presidency, if any, influence the direction of James Bond films moving forwards? I know that Trump, he's definitely, he, I think that he's definitely sent out a very particular message that other certain other world leaders have definitely echoed. So I do see a connection here with Boris Johnson and, and Donald Trump in terms of some of their messaging tactics um, and images moving forward. I'm just wondering how finite this is going to be, seeing as how we're going to have a different president come in in the United States, hopefully readjusting some of, of the US's global relations. And then I, I, I honestly don't know where then the UK will go from, from there, if they will continue on their current path or if they will pivot away from it. Um, and how any of this will impact uh, moving forward the Anglo-American relationship that and, and the way that it's being reflected in Bond films. So I, have, I don't really have anything to contribute to the actual question, but I think that there's a lot going on right now that will definitely inform the series moving forward. Yeah, and sorry, the final thing I should have said to, uh, to respond to John, sorry, Lisa, you've just reminded me of another really important element to this, is Britain as part of this kind of fantasy uh, involving global Britain is also trying to resurrect the relationship we had with our dominions, including your home country, Canada. So we've seen a huge turn yet again, a, a, almost like a Churchillian turn towards the English speaking world as part of that sort of coming to terms with Brexit and trying to change the relationship with our continental European neighbours, which again, I think you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm intrigued how Bond will try and represent the special relationship with the US. Um, so sorry, just a quick adjoint. Uh, uh. Well, thank you very much there. Um, maybe a last question or a couple of questions before the end uh, of this uh, interesting session. Okay, so it seems, uh, well, it's uh, quarter to seven. So I think it's, uh, anyway, it's time to, to stop there. I'm going just to, uh, uh, thank um, uh, Klaus and uh, Lisa for this uh, very interesting session. Uh, I'm going to thank also um, Jean-Robert and Camille and especially Chiara who helped me with the uh, 
um, technical misses. Um, now um, I'm going to end the YouTube feed and uh, right now, okay.